And uh, he's, uh, I, I wrote a bunch of stuff down here. I don't even know if I want to read it. I might skip it. Um, Chris is a, not only a measurement ninja, he's an actual ninja, like throwing stars and nunchucks and stuff. Like he does that, like literally trained as one. Um, but uh, it's, it's a, a label that we lovingly give to him in the measurement space because I don't know that there's anything that Chris can't figure out how to measure and hasn't already figured out to measure and shared that knowledge with his community. If you uh, follow me on Twitter and see the content that I share, it's an almost daily ritual. One of the first two or three things I share every day is whatever he wrote because I read him religiously. I always learn something from him. He's one of the top two or three smartest people I know, and that's why he's here. Chris Penn. You want this? Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you, Jason and the Louisville Digital Association. This talk is based on this book, Marketing Blue Belt. And as a surprise, surprise, Jason, uh, if you go to Marketing Blue Belt and enter the LDA Summit 2015 hashtag, you get a copy for free. This would be a good time to use your smartphone. So, surprise. Here's the problem that we're facing. We, uh, Mark Schaefer alluded this to this earlier. This is a tweet I put out this morning. A eh, hundred. 30-ish characters, five retweets, seven favorites. Behind the scenes, what you don't see is this. This tweet is 4,500 characters of data. The data about the tweet is 32 times the size of the tweet. That's how much data is happening. And look what's happening behind the scenes. There's IDs, there's follower counts, there's photos, all this stuff. We have a massive amount of data. How much data? From 2014, in one internet minute, all of these things happen. The one that really stuck out to me is 306 hours of YouTube content is uploaded every minute. For reference, the entirety of Game of Thrones is only 50 hours. Right? So think about that. Six seasons of Game of uh, six you know, boxes of Game of Thrones are uploaded every minute. That's how much video is being uploaded to the internet right now. Here's another example. This is uh, Signal Labs during the pre Republican uh, debate with, between Rand Paul and Chris Christie. This is a real-time representation of how fast opinion changed among 300 million people. You've heard of real-time marketing? Real-time marketing has gone out the window because you as a human being can't keep up with this. Only the machines can. And we have one more minor problem. The problem isn't cookies. The problem is the process of making cookies. If you've done any cooking, baking is the hardest aspect of cooking because it is both science, meaning measurement, and art. If, you, if you're grilling a steak, you can kind of fudge things, right? You know, there's, there's some give. There's, after a certain point, you're making tank armor. But for the most part, you can fudge it. When you're making cookies, just a few variations give you very different results. And more often than not, you get no result at all. This translates to marketing because we have to be both creative and data-driven. We cannot fudge the data part anymore, right? Because if you mess up and you omit something like salt, you have basically made bricks. Right? If you mess up and you leave out data or you don't know how to interpret data, your marketing is going to be equally untasty. We need a blueprint. We need a framework for understanding data. And here's the good news. The framework we're going to talk about today applies to any data. If you are UPS and you are looking at the number of packages shipped from point to point, that works. If you are... Make, uh, if you're selling coffee, you're selling bourbon, if you are uh, interacting with your community, any form of data can be used with this framework. So what is the framework? Seven steps. We measure things. We analyze them. We draw insights from that analysis. We develop a strategy, choose our tactics, execute, and then review. Seven steps. Any number. If you've got a number that's a series of data, you can use this on it to figure out what's going on. We're going to go through each of these steps. The first one is measurement. Measurement is about good data. And there are three aspects of good data. Good data is chosen well, meaning you've selected the right data. It's clean, meaning you've ensured its quality. And it's compatible. You've got formats you can work with. Let's tackle how do you choose data first. Is there anybody who is unfamiliar with the term KPI? Okay, key performance indicator. That these are the numbers that if this number goes to zero, you go out of business. A KPI is any number that if it goes to zero, you go out of business. So, 
If your website traffic goes to zero, do you go out of business? If you are Walmart with hundreds of stores, the answer is probably no. Right? You've got stores everywhere. If you are Amazon, the answer is yes. You are going out of business and very, very soon. If you have a million Twitter followers that, and they all leave you, is it, are you going to go out of business? For most of us, the answer is no. But I was on a panel last week with some folks who are Twitter celebrities. It hurts to say that, but they're Twitter celebrities who are paid thousands upon thousands of dollars to host Twitter parties and Twitter chats and things, and they make enormous sums of money that make me question my own occupation. <laughs> There's a, a dog that dresses up in costumes. Um, three million followers on Twitter. Their business is built on those Twitter followers, on that, on that audience. So if, if that number goes to zero, they go out of business. So your business has to have this number. What number is it? Choosing your data is like a road trip, right? There are some numbers that are going to basically be the end of the road trip, right? Gasoline in the tank is an important number. If that goes to zero, the trip is over. The number of times your kids complain, are we there yet? Not a KPI. What happens if you choose the wrong KPI? For anybody who's under the age of 30, this is a company that was called Blockbuster. They, they rented video cassettes. Think of it like Netflix with inconvenient plastic boxes that you had to drive to. At one time, they were in every shopping mall in the nation. At one time, this was the way you, you got entertainment other than going to the movie theater. They went out of business. Sprint bought the remains of their real estate holdings and turned them into, into you know, uh, cell phone stores. Why did they go out of business? Because they were looking at the wrong KPIs. They were looking at number of stores. They were looking at foot traffic. They were paying attention to KPIs that did not pay attention to how do people watch video. Netflix ate their lunch and their dinner and their dessert, and they are gone now. The second aspect of data is that it has to be clean. It has to be operational data that is in good working condition. Here's an example from 2005. Google had its maps service. And if you were to start in, say, Louisville or Topeka, Kansas or wherever, and put in Tokyo, Japan as your driving destination, you would actually get directions that say, kayak across the Pacific Ocean. This is probably not the best way to get to Tokyo. <laughs> it will get you there. But this is an example of bad data, right? Of data that is misleading you because that's not re really is not the best way. Now, of course, Google has fixed things up, so now it will say you should probably fly there instead. Here's an example more close to home. I was looking at my uh, web analytics this morning in Google Analytics, and it said that compared to my uh, peers, oh, look, a laser, um, I really suck at email marketing. I, I, I don't get it. Why, why is Google saying, I suck at email marketing? I send out a newsletter every week and lots of people open it and read it. Well, it turns out, in my newsletter, I'm sharing links I shared on Twitter. All of the credit is going to Twitter and not to email. Right? So I have bad data. I have an attribution problem. This is so critical. In your own marketing, you're going to have to identify those problems and figure out what your, what your data quality problems are and fix them. The last is compatibility. We have probably more tools. As Rosemary pointed out in her presentation with Scott Brinker's chart, there are 2,000 different tools. How do you evaluate all these different marketing tools? The easy answer is look for tools that offer you the ability to check your data out in common formats, like CSV files, comma-separated value files. If you run into a vendor who does not let you export your data, they are trying to lock you in run away, tell them where the door is, and don't let, it, don't let it hit them on the way out. So that's how you determine the first stage of measurement. Good data, clean, chosen well, and compatible. It talks to other systems. The second step in our framework is analysis. Analysis is all about what happened. Data itself doesn't tell you anything, right? Data is just a pile of files somewhere on a server. From the Greek word to loosen up, we are talking about taking the data and extracting and letting things come out of that data to understand what it is. There are three basic tools of analysis. Visualization, derivatives, and moving averages. There are also about 500 not basic tools, but we'll get to these three first. Here's a quick visualization. Can someone spot the pattern in this data? 
Cats are increasing, yes. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Can someone spot the pattern in this data? No, you can't do that. Nobody can do that because we as humans can't process data by large sets. Here's another example. How many lions are in this picture? Somebody yell out numbers. One, two, more than one. There are three. Our eyes cannot sort out visual clutter. The third lion is on the left-hand side. You can see its eyes and its nose there on the grass. We have a very hard time separating out visual clutter. We cannot visualize data unaided, so we have to be able to cut through the clutter. If I take that big, big table and turn it into a chart, I'm in a little bit better condition. Now I can see better. If you do nothing else, go into your copy of the spreadsheet software of your choice and look at the charts buttons. If you have not done this already, look at what each chart is and what they do because they are specialized. They will tell you how to think about data. A pie chart tells you percentage of whole. So anytime you're trying to figure out something compared to something else as a percentage of a whole, you should be using a pie chart. I'll get that. Um, Bars and columns tell you how things change over time. Put enough bars on a chart, it turns into an area chart. When that gets too cluttered, take away the bottom stuff and you end up with a line chart. So that is how these charts function. Get to know these things. If you have never read it yet, there's a great book by uh, Edward Tufte called The Visualization of Quantitative Information. It's on Amazon, it's not a Kindle book. It's like 30 bucks for the hardcover, but it's an excellent book that will teach you how to think about charting data. If you don't chart data as your first step in analysis, chances are either you've got really bad data or you've got a, you're asking the wrong question. So start here. Sure, the title of the book was The Visualization of Quantitative Information. The second step is derivatives, and not the calculus kind. I don't want anyone to have a heart attack this late in the afternoon. Analysis is about change, right? It's comparison and change. What has changed? If I give you two data points, like here's where I work, and there's the airport. I've given you two data points, but we haven't talked about what's changed. How long does it take to get there? How many miles does it take to go from point A to point B? Analysis is about change. And what we can glean from that is what to do. So here's where I work, here's the airport. Some ways of getting to the airport take 15 minutes. Some ways take 51 minutes. Some ways take 22 minutes. If I have 45 minutes to catch a flight, one of these ways is not like the other. One of these ways means I'm taking the next flight. So we have to analyze to figure out not just the data points themselves, point A, point B, but what's the change between the two of them. And there's a really easy formula for doing this. What's the new number minus the old number divided by the old number? Do this with all of your data and you will start to see how much things change. You have 22 Twitter followers today, you have 25 tomorrow, right? You have a change. Not only did you get three more, but there's a rate of change. Why is this important? If you were to visualize the rate of change, how fast things change in your marketing, you will know how fast you can go. Right? Kind of going back to the airport example, if I have 45 minutes and I know one method only lets me get there in 51 minutes, I'm going to miss the plane. If I know that my marketing at its, at its best point can only get me a 200% increase in the number of leads I generated or the amount of website traffic I generated, then if I'm at the end of the quarter or at the end of the year and I'm 40% down, well, I'm going to be looking for a job because I know that my marketing can't go any faster. I'll have to do something different. So try tracking your changes in any type of data you're working with. The third is moving averages. How's my website doing? Kind of good, kind of bad, not really sure. This goes back to the lion example. There's still a lot of visual clutter here. If I make an average of the last seven days and just kind of do that across the chart, now I can see much better. Actually, I am going to need a new job. Uh, thankfully, it's only on my personal website. Any of your charts, any of your graphs, anything you export from Google Analytics, from Twitter, from Facebook, at all, do a moving average on it and find out. You can see 
much more easily how things are going. Facebook will give you day-by-day -day data, but again, it's a lot of clutter. It looks like this. Apply a moving average and you'll have a much better idea of how your social media marketing is going, how your content marketing is going, etc. So that's analysis. We have the data. It's clean. We kind of understand what happened. We now have to talk about insight. Why did something happen? Insight, unsurprisingly, is from Latin, basically means to look inside. We have to be able to answer the question, why? What are you going to do about it? To any analysis we present, in order to do that, we need those insights. So there's three basic tools for generating insights. The first is reverse engineering, which is a fancy way of saying work from back to front. In the martial art I practice, one of my instructors says, if you screwed up a technique, look at the immediate preceding step to see what you did wrong. So you get out of the way of a punch, well, punch in the head. Okay, why'd you get punched in the head? Well, maybe your foot was in the wrong spot. Maybe your timing was off. Maybe you didn't bend your knees. But you did something wrong in that previous step that led to an adverse consequence. So this is an example of a social media marketing funnel. You start at your audience, you have your engagement, and you have the actions that people have to take. Remember what we just said about analysis. We want to chart the change from, from, from one series to the next. If the change is significantly different, that's where we start drawing insights. Why do we get 50% of the people who are in our audience to engage, but 5% to take an action? What are we doing wrong in that part? Chart out your marketing funnel, or your customer journey, or whatever fancy word you want to use for it this week, and say, what's the difference from step A, B, C, D? Measure them all out, figure out what happen, where the, the most broken number is. If you want to make a one difference in your marketing for 2016, chart out that customer journey and find the number that's, that's doing the worst and fix that one first. Journaling is another one. Journaling is a fancy word for take notes. This is an example of some website traffic, uh, I believe from my website. Why did that happen? Here's another example. Why did that happen? It turns out in this particular instance, we dug in, we did our analysis, what happened. We can see the spike. Now we have to figure out why. So we did some Googling and it turns out that we got, uh, for, for this website, got a link from Reddit um, on the day that their CEO was fired, um, talking about when the best time to release a press release with bad news in it was, which was basically Friday afternoons. No one's paying any attention. And the, Reddit, the folks in the Reddit community posted a link in their discussion, which had hundreds of thousands of comments. This is not necessarily traffic I wanted, but it just kind of showed up. But now I can explain why. So that when I go to do year-over-year -year comparisons for my marketing plan, I can say, well, disregard this day because, yes, we got a lot of traffic, but it's all crap. Right? So you should be able to explain why to any anomaly in your data. The third is inductive logic. If you are a fan of Sherlock Holmes, he actually never did really much in the way of deduction. He did, did induction, which is to take a bunch of data and figure out what it tells you. This is an example. We had, had one client who had a whole bunch of great website traffic, but no goals set in their goal, Google Analytics at all. They're like, so how do we do? I'm like, I don't know. You have no goals set. They're like, well, can you tell us something, anything? So we looked at a, a very similar website and said, OK, what things correspond to goals for a similar industry? And it turns out, for this one, it was new users, new visitors to the website. So we went back to the client and said, OK, here's kind of what we can see, what we can induce from this pattern in the data. This is a free tool called SofaStats, if you are, want to do statistics and not spend a ton of money on it. Um, it. It's not the world's friendliest product, but it is free. An even better one? that I've just started using in the last couple of months is from IBM called Watson, the same computer that won Jeopardy. Uh, IBM has managed to tame its destructive power in uh, becoming the next Skynet by turning it to something slightly less evil marketing. <clears throat> you can load your data into Watson, and for how many people in the room are statisticians by trade? Okay, that's same as me. None of us are. We're marketers, right? Watson, the computer, does a lot of the work for us. You take your data, you load it in, and then Watson will automatically pick and decide what things are relevant. So I said to Watson, here's my Twitter analytics. I uploaded the last year of Twitter data to Watson. And I said, tell me something about this data. I have no clue what I'm looking for, but I know I want people to click on my links and, and visit my website. Watson, tell me what you know. It did a bunch of math. Um, mostly linear analysis of variance, and said, here's what you need to know. These five things contribute to link clicks. Do them first. So number one, get your engagement rate up. 
get more impressions. Uh, number three is way over here on uh, favorites. Um, get people to visit your profile and then p get people to click on stuff from your profile. If you want people to click on your links on Twitter, Watson said do these five things. Now this is not applicable to anyone else in this room. This is me only. But you can take your Twitter data or your Facebook data or your Google Analytics data, export it to a CSV, because that's what Watson speaks, and feed it in here and Watson will say here are the things that you should do. Test this out. I tested this out. I said, okay, Watson, I'm going to take your advice. I started doing more tweets with photos in them, lots more photos, um, to get engagement because they're seen more, they're seen better. And I went from getting about 0.16% uh, click-through rate to about a 5% click-through rate, which if you do the math is something around a, a 20x increase. That's the power of these tools. And the good news, by the way, also is that Watson costs $30 a month. So it's in range of everyone in the room, hopefully. Sometimes when you're doing analysis, there's an external factor too. So you have to know your audience, you have to know things. Take a look at this elevator panel. This is taken at the Hotel Nico in San Francisco. They did not pay me to say that. What's missing? And why? Why is four missing? Thank you. You guys I'm sorry. Four is synonymous with death in Asian culture, and it's in San Francisco, so it's a higher Asian population. There's an external factor in this data. The way you pronounce the number four in Chinese and Japanese is synonymous with death. Um, generally not the floor you want to stay on, the death floor. But if you were not aware of these externalities, if you didn't know the culture and the audience, you would be sitting there going, I guess they screwed up. Right, they just, there's data missing. So it's incumbent upon you to look in your data when you're doing analysis to figure out why, to know your audience very, very well, ideally be a part of your audience, be a part of your community, like Rosemary was saying, so that when these anomalies creep up in your data, you can explain them. <clears throat> so we've talked about the data, we've talked about what happened, we've talked about why. This is inevitably the next question that your CEO, CMO, state board of directors, or whoever says, what, well, what next, what are you gonna do about it? What you do next is strategy, which is probably the most abused word in all of marketing ever. Ask 100 CMOs of what marketing strategy means and you'll get 400 answers. This is strategy summarized somewhat concisely. <clears throat> strategy is your goals times your methods, limited by the time you have <clears throat> and the resources of the environment you're in. If you have if you're someone who's talking to you about strategy and there is no goal in there, that's not a strategy, that's a wish, right? If somebody's talking about strategy and they have a number, like $20 million in revenue, but they don't tell you anything about the methods they're gonna to use to get there, that's not a strategy, that's a demand, right? It's basically, it's another form of a wish. And it's multiplicative. Right goal, wrong, strat wrong method, bad strategy. Wrong goal, right method, still a negative, no strategy. Only when you get the right goal with the right method do you have strategy? Here's an example. I'm hungry. You're hungry. Yeah, actually, you probably want to go drinking. But if you're hungry, this will feed you about as well as this. Right? So you have a goal not to be hungry anymore. You have two methods. How do you choose between them? Well, if you have not a lot of time, this is probably not the place to eat. Right? This is the place to eat if you don't have a lot of time. If you don't have a lot of money, this is also not the place to eat. This is probably the place to eat, right? So you have limiting variables like time and resources and stuff. On the other hand, if you want to not have indigestion, this is probably the place to eat. Actually, this is not true. I love eating at McDonald's. Um, <clears throat> and so far, so good. <laughs> but goals times methods limited by the time you have and the environment you're in. So when you're looking at any funnel, you have to ask yourself, what are the goals, what are the methods, and what are li what's limiting? Believe it or not, as a marketer, as marketers, our greatest limiting resource is not money, it's time. If you have $500, but you have 26 weeks to execute a campaign, you have far more options than if you have one week, right? The options are very, very different. Time is what limits us. For anybody who watches football, plays football, plays video games of people playing football, you know that there's a huge difference between, you know, seven to, seven to nothing, 14 to nothing when it's the first quarter, right? right? 
when it's 7 to 7 or 21 to 21 and it's your fourth and 15 and there's two seconds on the clock, your strategies are very, very different, right? You deflate the ball a little. So I'm from New England. <laughs> But you understand the meaning, right? Strategy is goals times methods. The next logical question is, once you have got a strategy, which is defined as your goals and the methods you're going to use, where do you get, how do you understand your methods, right? How do you choose the methods you're going to use? That's tactics. If strategy is a menu, which it is, your tactics are the cookbook. If strategy is the menu, Tactics to the cookbook. And by the way, that's how you explain the difference to somebody who doesn't want to listen to goals and methods. Right? A strategy is a coherent narrative from beginning to end, like a menu. A cookbook is a pile of stuff. The problem is, as marketers, we struggle to even understand what we can do. How many of you have ever inventoried what you know as a marketer? OK, nobody. Here's your homework assignment. Go to any popular website. There's Marketing Land. This one's, this one's Marketing Profs. Go to the categories page on their website and print this thing out. It's long. It will take you a little while. Check off the things that you know how to do. Right? So if you are Rosemary, you're going to check off community management. If you're Mark Schaefer, you're going to check off chief marketing officer. If you are Jason Falls, you're probably going to check off something like customer behavior. Then once you know what you can do, Start building a plan for all the things you don't know. That's your career development right there. That's your education plan. That's the layout, the strategy for yourself for the next five years. Know what all of these things do and be able to do some of them. But this is how you broaden your cookbook. Because if all you know how to do is make mac and cheese, no matter what budget you have, you're having mac and cheese. Right? If that's all you can cook. If all you know how to do is email marketing, you're going to try and solve every marketing problem you have with email marketing. I was in that boat for a number of years. That was my strength, and it didn't get me very far. Broaden your strategy. Build your cookbook. Expand it. After you've chosen your strategy and you've selected your methods, you have to execute. It's just doing the work, but again, your greatest limiting resource is time. If you don't have the uh, uh, marketing calendar set up with an order of operations for everything you're doing, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. How many people have set up a 2016 marketing calendar yet? Anyone? Yeah, good. A couple of people. How many people have a marketing calendar for the last quarter of 2015 that you're executing on now? OK, again, your homework for the next time we all get together here like this is for every hand in the room to be up. Because if you need to be able to do this to coordinate, to make things happen together. I work in public relations. Public relations is about getting people to become aware of you and trust you. When the ad agency is sending one message, the PR team is doing another message, and then you're blogging about a third message, you end up with some absolute disaster sometimes. Can you imagine picking up the phone, calling a friend, saying, hey, how you doing? It's, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, let's, let's get together for dinner. And then when you go there and you get to, to dinner, they slap you in the face, yell F you, and, and walk away. That would be a really weird experience. They probably wouldn't be your friend very, very long, right? But when marketing and PR and advertising and content marketing are all out of step because you don't have a calendar, that's what happens. Typically, it's the ad guys who end up slapping somebody in the face, but it does happen. The other thing you can do to make your execution nearly flawless is beer. Specifically, everyone who touches your marketing should be getting together on Fridays for beer. If you have IT folks involved, if you have strategy involved, if you have accounting involved, get people together for beer every Friday. Finally, at the end of the cycle, you've measured, you've done your analysis, you've built your insights, you've chosen your strategy, you've picked your tactics, you execute, you review, you look back, and this is the start of the cycle all over again. This is where this is this is all that happens. You just keep reviewing and reviewing and reviewing. So let me show you an example, one that you can do uh, today. Inside of Google Analytics, there is a feature called benchmarking. It's on the left-hand side is under the audience menu. And you want to choose uh, audience, benchmarking, and channels. Pick the year, all of 2015, and pick your site. Up at the top, you'll be able to choose your industry and uh, the country you operate in. And what you'll end up with is something that looks like this. So first step, we have our measurement. We have our data. Let's analyze this data. What do we see here? We see social media. 
doing really well. So this benchmarking tool tells me how I'm doing compared to other marketing companies. When you do this in your own Google Analytics, you're gonna compare it to other companies like yours. I'm doing okay in organic search. I'm not doing so well in, in referral traffic, so I probably need to fire my PR agency, which thankfully I don't have one. <clears throat> Direct traffic, email traffic, display, other advertising, paid search. So I've done my analysis. I can see what happened. Now it's time to ask why. Why am I doing so well in social? Well, we looked at that earlier. We're doing, I'm doing so well in social because I screwed up my email marketing, right? So I know one of my immediate steps is to fix my email marketing. But why is referral traffic so low compared to all of my competitors? I would go and look at my competitors, use tools like SpyFu or SEMrush or Moz to identify where they're getting their, their, their referral traffic from, where they're getting, they're getting their links from. I see here that my competitors are all doing display ads, 9,000 visits for the year. Uh, my competitors are doing paid search, 7,000 visits. So I now know these are things I probably should be doing if I want to catch up to my competitors. All right, so I've done my insights. I know why my traffic is lower than theirs. I know why I'm behind uh, in, in some key areas. Now I've got to choose my strategies. Which of these is the biggest priority? Well, I can fix this with very limited resources. Right? Because again, strategy, goals times methods limited by time and resources. I know that referral traffic doesn't take a ton of resources to fix. It takes effort. It takes time. But I have time. I don't have a ton of money. I'm not going to fix display or paid yet because, again, I don't have a lot of money for, the, for my personal website. So I'm going to try and fix these because I know the parameters of what's limiting me. After this, I have to choose my tactics. How am I going to go out and get more referral traffic? Uh, for those of you who I was not already following uh, today for the conference, you may have seen me follow you. Uh, hi. Um, but that's part of building that relationship to eventually build that referral traffic. Execute on this, and then again, next time, uh, next quarter rolls on, I'm going to measure this again. So that's the process from beginning to end. How do we measure, analyze, get insights, select strategy? Choose tactics, execute, and review. Uh, I believe we have exactly eight minutes for questions. Yes. So you mentioned a few different tools throughout your presentation between Watson, SpyFu, Moz, um, SEMrush. What would you say if you could only invest in a few things? What's worth the money? If I had to invest in only a few things, I would invest, number one, in a good email marketing service provider. And I say this because email is the only channel you own. You do not own your Twitter profile. You do not own your Facebook profile. You own none of that. Your email list is yours for as long as you continue to pay the bills. And if you export the data, you have the data regardless. So email is first and foremost. Also, by the way, in case anyone missed the announcements, Facebook has the ability to do what's called uh, email matching. So you upload your email list, and you can show uh, email list, and you can show ads to just the people on your list. Twitter can do that too. And as of this week, Google now lets you do that with AdWords, with remarketing lists for search, with Gmail, and with YouTube. So your email list is the most valuable thing that you can possibly create. The second tool I would invest in is a spreadsheet. Because as a as, as friend of the conference, Tom Webster has said, if you are bad at small data, you'll be bad at big data. So invest in a decent spreadsheet. The third tool I'd invest in probably would be, um, I wouldn't invest in it. I'd Google Analytics, learn how to use it. There is a website that Google operates called Analytics Academy. It's analyticsacademy.withgoogle.com. And it contains five courses completely free of charge that will teach you the fundamentals of digital analysis in a much more coherent way than I just did. The measurement platform, e-commerce, mobile, and tag management. And that is enough to get you up and running with Google Analytics. And of course, Google Analytics charges you no money because they just take all your data and aggregate it. So that's where I would start. Right? Start with an email program, a good analysis tool, and then Google Analytics. Next question. Ready to start drinking. Oh, wait. What do I think is a good, what do I think is a good email program? Um, again, it's a program that's got to be able to import and export your data freely and easily. There are any number of companies that uh, deliver as one of the sponsors here. Um, there are, it's all, a lot's going to be dependent on your budget and how much you can spend on it. Um, if you are technically proficient, 
the provider matters. Like Amazon has a service called Simple Email Service that delivers emails for a fraction of uh, you know a penny per thousand cents. The downside is there's no interface. You have to be able to, sp to speak directly to their servers, which is hard for most people. Um, but take a look around. In fact, after the, at the at the reception, talk to the deliver folks and ask them, and then take their answers and compare them to all the other major vendors out there. So there's MailChimp and Eloqua and, and you name it. There's, there's, a, there's a, a thing out there that's at a budget that you can afford somewhere. Other questions? All right, resume, uh, begin drinking. Chris Bain, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, buddy. Wow. That's some smart stuff right there. All right, before everybody starts